interesting to me. So that's the first time you ever told the story in public? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is I got a little bit of a testimony because last night when we were here at prayer, I ended up leaving and somebody texted me and said, hey, what you doing? I said, I'm leaving prayer and I'm tired. And he said, okay, well, could you come pray for somebody at the hospital? And so I went and the person was in ICU and then it was from an, an overdose situation. And anyway, uh, so, you know, the family ne didn't necessarily know the Lord that I know of or whatever, but <coughs> they wanted me to go in and pray. And so I did. I went in and I prayed. I prayed the prayer of faith. Amen. I prayed the prayer of faith and uh, yeah. for healing. <coughs> um, and then I took an opportunity to kind of talk. And I shared a little bit about my testimony. I shared a little bit about your daughter's testimony because wow. she was only like one room over. Oh, wow. And um, I told him, I said, you know, the God I serve, I don't question one bit whether or not he can call to raise this young man out of this bed. I believe it with all of my heart because I said, look, I saw it happen to a young lady that was here. And, and you know, the way Pat told the story, too, like I would go every every day that I could, yep. almost every day, and I would we would pray for her. But then I would read Psalm 23 yep. to her. And then one day I walked in and like she's got so what you call extubated. Well, did she have the tray maybe by that time? No, it was when they extubated her. I was surprised that they even ended up putting the tray. But when they extubated her, pulled the tube out of her mouth, I like they we didn't know what she was gonna do. From what I remember, it's almost like she wasn't responding to anything. And so I'll be honest with you, it's like short of a miracle, she may not breathe because the brain controls the breathing. And so I walk in there. Not knowing what to expect. And when I do, she's sitting straight up. She's looking straight ahead. She looks at me. She smiles. And, uh, and I was like, wow, praise God, you know. So it was a real, it was a real miracle. And uh, it really was. And I was able to share that with the family last night about what happened. And at the same time, you know, it, would, it also gave me an opportunity to say whether or not. Because, look, you may not think that this is faith. But I pray the prayer of faith. I believe that God can heal that young man. But you know, yeah. I also took an opportunity to say, and I, and I felt like it was anointed when it was all said and done, and I'll tell you why, but I said, you know, no matter how we slice this, this is the result of sin. No matter how you slice it, this is wow. the result of sin. That's right. And I said, but God so loved the world. Yeah. And that he gave his only begotten son. My and God. God's will is that, that we would be saved. And That's that the right. blood of Jesus yes, will save yes. our soul. Amen. 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 And sometimes God uses tragedy to result in yes. triumph. Right. Sometimes yes. God uses negative situations in people's yes. lives to grab a hold of them. Yes. And yes. I can tell you one thing. God wants to grab a hold of y'all. He wants yes. you to give your heart and your life to the Lord. And anyway, when it was all said and done, I was, you know, I was getting ready to leave. And one lady said, I really liked your sound. Praise God. That was really good. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. So let's pray for that young man. His name's LJ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up LJ to you right now. And pray, Lord God, that you would minister healing in the midst of that room. Lord God, we thank you for your healing presence. We pray that you would move in and that you would touch him, Lord God. That you'd raise, raise him up, Lord, just as you did for Sherry. We pray that you would raise him up out of that bed, Lord God, and that it would be a testimony to your healing power, Lord. We ask you, Lord, also to move upon that family. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to, to draw them to you. Lord, your word says that no one comes to the Father unless he is first drawn by the No one comes to you, Jesus, unless he's first drawn by the Father. And we pray, Lord God, that you would draw in him. Draw them by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, praise God. Man, I'm glad we did that. And I believe that we'll have more testimonies coming. But I do want to preach because I do believe God wants us to um, have the Word of God Amen. in the midst of our services. Amen. And yeah. I just thought, uh, you know, this is part of, a, I guess, a series of where the Lord had kind of led me to call it something like the, the letters of the apostles. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of the things I tried to explain this before that in the letters of the apostles, there's, it, it's basically like commentary connected to the Gospels. It gives us added understanding. Jesus sometimes spoke in a way in parables. He spoke in parables quite often, and there's a lot of interpretation that has to go into it. Um, but at the same time, many times the apostles take what Jesus wrote, and they explain it to us in a way that's very clear. One of the things 
that, you know, since we've been having this church, um, it was formed on the concept of how Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 1.18 when he says, you know, for those that are perishing, you know, it's, a foolish, it's foolishness to them that are perishing, but unto us that are being saved, it is the power of God, talking about the message of the cross, all right, the word of the cross. In the Greek, it's logos, the logos of the cross, the message of the cross. Now, what some people may not understand is this, is that Paul also said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them which believe, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So he said, and he said that the power is in the gospel. He also said, the same author also said that the power of God, it resides in the message of the cross. And so really and truly, you can go around and you can say that, but to the, to the mind, if he's not, if he, if he hasn't been anointed by the Holy Spirit, or if we have not received a renewed mind, we might have difficulty understanding what that means. And let me just give you a synoptic version, okay? A synoptic version of the message of the cross as it relates to to your sanctification as it relates to your to your walk with God as it relates to godliness in the life of the believer the way the way that it works is this is that you and I born in Adam were born in sin and sin separates us from the presence of God sin prevents us from being able to have access to the presence of God but what Jesus did at the cross, when we received that for ourselves, we're now redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been reconciled to God, and because we've been made righteous, because we've been clothed with the righteousness of the Lamb, you understand that if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're not righteous in the eyes of God. Right. Does He love you? Of course He loves you. That's why He sent His Son Jesus. To die for you. But if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're still dead in your sin and you're guilty. And there's no access to the presence of God. But now clothed in the righteousness of God through faith, you can now have access into the very presence of God. Through that's what it says. We enter into the Holy of Holies through a new and we enter boldly through a new and living way through the veil, which is his flesh. His flesh was ripped. So listen, his death and, and, and the exchange, he took our guilt and he gave us his righteousness. And now that we're clothed in his righteousness, we can enter into the presence of God. And in the presence of God, there's freedom. Where the anointing of the Lord is, yokes of bondage are broken. That's the idea of the message of the cross. That's really the whole gospel. That's the whole gospel message. That you and I were, we were undone and we were born in sin and we had no reconcile. We, we, we did not have a way to enter into the presence of God, but God sent his son Jesus and made a way for us to be able to enter in. Amen. Most of the terminology connected to what we're talking about comes from the Apostle Paul, right? That's right. I've been teaching the Apostle Paul's letters for years. And I got to be honest with you, a lot of times... When I first started understanding the, this, what I'm telling you about, I kind of I stayed away from a lot of other places. I'm kind of glad I did then, but now I, I, I love the whole of God's work, right? And the other night, I'm just telling you, I was being led by the Holy Spirit to spend some time in, the, in these letters that Peter wrote, all right? And as I got to this spot here, there's a reason, because I wanted you to see this. It says, and to knowledge, let, let, me, let me back up a little bit. He's talking about the fact that God has called us and that he's giving us exceeding and great promises and that by these we become partakers of the divine nature. We're going to say that because I'm going to preach the majority of these letters. But tonight I have a specific, I believe the Holy Spirit put something on my heart and I want to share it with you. But look what he says. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now I want, I want to talk to you for a second because... Most people that if you've read a lot of the Bible, you understand that it's faith. That even yes. the Apostle Paul said, justification by faith. Yes. It's faith in what Christ has done that allows God to see us as innocent. Yes. It's yes. faith in what Jesus has done that allows God to clothe us with the righteousness of Christ. But look what this passage is saying. It's saying, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, 
to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things, look at this, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall ne neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind, and he cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. The Lord doesn't want you to forget that you were purged from your own sins. Listen to me, church. The Lord does not want you to forget that you were a, that you were a sinner saved by grace. I appreciate the word that says, I'm no longer a sinner saved by grace, but instead I'm a saint of God. Hallelujah. I've been made holy. But look, just like he told that lame man at the pull of Bethesda, he said, pick up your mat. And listen, there's a lot going on there. I don't have time to break it down, but it was the Sabbath. And you're not supposed to pick up your mat on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to break the law. But you think that Jesus didn't forget it was the Sabbath? Come on, right? Well, if he forgot it was the Sabbath that day, then why did he put make clay and put it on the guy's eyes on the Sabbath too? Because that was against the law also. He did it on purpose. You know why he did it on purpose? Because they were misusing the law. Religion misuses the law. And instead, they try to hold people in bondage. But the Lord has come to set people free. From religion and to set them free yes. from bondage. Amen. Yes. And so anyway, I want you to know that let's just let's just stick to this right here. He that that that, that lacks these things is blind. The Lord wants us to remember, just like you picked up that map. Yes. God wants us to remember what we used to be. You don't want us to live there, my friend. Right. We're not supposed to live in our past. When we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 that we become new creations. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. When you get born again, I'm telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you are a new creation yes. in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You no longer have to be bound by a sinful nature. Right. But whenever I read these scriptures, Look what it says in verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Look at this. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Oh, my God. Wow. Okay, so now we got to kind of like, especially you message of the cross, folks. Now, yeah, I know y'all a little bit of a Got to be. But this is the scripture. This is the holy word of God. Look what it says. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about is uh, something that Sister Brenda said when she preached that was very, to me, it was very powerful. When she was talking about the various, uh, to how to reverence the Lord. And she used the scripture when she got started. Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, you can just go ahead and go there. I got this up right here. Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, as I was reading these, these letters, and I'm going to tell you, I want you to, I want you to know that I'm going to kind of share with you something that the Lord told me late at night whenever he was moving me towards this particular passage or to, to start teaching in, this, in these letters of Peter, that um, when I was reading this, I was like, Lord, you know, I need to understand this better. And I think that it goes along with the scripture that she said. See, when you're, when you're a believer... When you're a true child of God and you're born again from the dead, then what the Holy Spirit wants you and I to do is to work in communion with Him. Yes. You understand that? Yes. The, the Word of God says that we are to have communion with the Holy Spirit. The, the word communion literally means to have joint participation. Yes. Yes. You see, you and I can actually prevent the Holy Spirit from moving in our heart and in our life. Right. You may not understand that, right. but that is absolutely the truth. You and I, for our unwillingness to yield right. to the will of God, can prevent the Holy Spirit from working in our hearts and in our lives. Now, how can we... Uh, refuse to yield to the word of God. Well, sometimes, in some ways, we could 
not, not care about the whole of God's work. And, and whenever you understand the message of the cross and what it teaches, you know what it teaches? It teaches that Jesus has already broken the power of sin over your life. Does it, does it not teach that? I'm talking about for sanctification. It also, the message of the cross also talks about salvation. It also talks about reconciling mankind to the Father. It's talking about the kingdom plan that God has, right, for souls to come into the kingdom. But I got to tell you that it also teaches us that God wants to have a relationship with us. And when we truly get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us, God wants to reveal himself in a deeper way. Yeah. And so when you, your eyes light upon a scripture like that and you see it, and it tells you, add to your faith brotherly kindness. Add to your faith temperance. Add to your faith patience. Then you know what it's, what it's telling you is this. Jesus paid a high price so that you could add temperance to your walk. Yeah. So that you could add patience to your walk. Right. So that you can see the fruit of the Holy Spirit being produced in your life. But at this, And listen, they, Brother Borg used to preach this. Brother Borg said, when are we as message of the cross people going to start seeing the fruit of the Spirit operating in our life? When are we going to start seeing the work of the Lord operating in our life? When are we going to start living our lives in such a way that self-control is part of our walk? Yeah. When are we going to start living our lives in such a way when patience and endurance hupomone yeah. to be able to remain under the trial? Look, you're going to go through trials, Christian. You are going to go through trials on this earth, and if you ain't been through one yet, tighten your belt up because it's about to happen. Hallelujah. Right? Yes. But you and I need to learn we have access. Yeah. We have access to the Word of God. And the whole of God's Word is important. We're supposed to be in the Proverbs, we're supposed to be in the Psalms. And when our eyes light upon the Holy Word of God, we're supposed to put our faith in it. And we're supposed to say, Lord, Help me to add temperance yeah. to my walk. Lord, help me to yeah. add endurance to my walk. Yeah. The word God says a brother easily offended is like a city without law. Lord, help me not to be easily offended. Yeah. Lord, help yeah. me that if the preacher says something that I don't like, I don't get mad and pick up my toys and go play in another sandbox somewhere. <laughs> Lord, help me to be stable. Help me to be rooted and grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, help the seed of the gospel be planted on the inside of my heart. Lord, bear fruit. Yes. Yes. And my. So, That's it. I had an ordeal with the Lord that night. I was like, Lord, I need you to show me more. I don't understand completely because it almost sounds like works. Well, it is works. <laughs> See, once you once you got the Holy Spirit living in you, you you're not saved by works. Let's understand that. Right. You're not saved by works. And it's really continued faith in the finished work of Christ that gives you access to the Spirit of God that can even help you to joint participate with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can work in your heart and your life. The Holy Spirit wants to teach us to submit to the will of the Word of God. So I was like, all right, Lord, this is good. So the Lord starts dealing with me. And I, I'll be honest, I'm going to just tell you to play by play kind of, but not really. I got to go to the restroom. And as I was walking... I felt like the Spirit of God was, was showing me, you, I, want you to, I want you to see, I want you to pay attention to what Peter said here. As a matter of fact, I said, and all of a sudden this thought hit me. The Lord said, he was walking with me. He, he, and I said this like this, I said, Lord, you want me to listen to your friend? You want me to pay attention to the writings of your friend? Now listen. He's an apostle. He's a disciple. Amen. He's a learner of Christ. Okay. He's a martyr for the kingdom of God. But do you think he wasn't friends with the Lord? There was three people closest to Jesus. And I would say Peter was right there in the middle. It was the sons of thunder. You had John and James and Peter right there in the middle. And guess what? Those three were with Jesus. Whenever there's only three with Jesus, it's usually them three. When it's, I gotta be honest with you, when there's only one with Jesus, it's usually John. But nevertheless, when there's three with Jesus, it's usually those three. And I thought to myself, Lord, he was with you. And you know, I have to tell you this. 
Then I thought, where was Paul at that moment? I'm not disagreeing the Apostle Paul. Y'all know how much I love the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is my second favorite man that's ever walked the face of the earth. Next to Jesus, I love the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah. He was an intellectual. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. His writings that the Holy Spirit gave him just exhilarate my spirit when I see what he has talked about. But you know... The Apostle Paul, whenever Peter was walking with Jesus, you know where he was? He was in the midst of the Sanhedrin. He was trying to climb the ecclesiastical ladder to become the next great Pharisee. And, and, and guess where Peter was? Peter was walking with Jesus. Peter was uh, allowing Jesus to use his boat. Amen? As a matter of fact, so what I want to do, maybe going to try to probably cut it short a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of a picture. Let's take a look into the life of Peter. Let's just try to understand him a little better is all I'm trying to do for tonight. And then we're going to get into some of his writings as we move forward. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a, trying to take evidence in the scripture. We're trying to open up the evidence in the scripture. And we're trying to get a glimpse of Peter and to see maybe how his faith was formed. What made it him to be such a man that when it came time for him to breathe his last breath, he said, no, you're not going to nail me right side up on that cross. You're going to turn me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Now, look, I'll tell you this. Some people question that. Some people think it wasn't even Peter. Some people think it was Simon Magnus, the sorcerer, and that it was a cult thing because he was upside down because Simon Magus, the sorcerer, was also noted to be in Rome around the same time, and Peter was in prison in Rome. But I'm here to tell you this. Church tradition says it was Peter. Church tradition says that Peter said, I am not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Turn me upside down and kill me that way. What was it that happened in this man's life that would bring him to the place that he was willing to give his life for the Lord? Amen? So, you know, let's go ahead and take a look. The, the, the first scripture I want to talk to you about is in Luke chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 3. So, it says he entered into one of the ships. This is talking about Jesus. So, Jesus entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. And pray for him. I'm going to change uh, translation. Sorry about that because I'm going to go somewhere. This is the NASB. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let them, and let them, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Now, I just want to take just a little minute to say something that it seems as though if you look in Matthew chapter 13, that this is the same time Jesus is in the boat. And he does a teaching. He does a series of teachings while he's on the boat of multiple kingdom parables. He talks about the, the parable of the sower. He talks about the parable of the tares and the wheat. He talks about, uh, also one of the parables is about how a net, a net gathers fish. And that in the end of the age, God's going to sort them out. The angels of God are going to sort out the fish. And the good ones are going to be burned up in unquenchable fire. And the good ones are going to go to be with the Lord. Amen. And then he asked them, Jesus asked them at the end, do you understand these things that I say to you? And the people said, yes. The reason I wanted to point that out is, is that it seems like this is the same spot. So I'm thinking to myself, Peter is actually sitting in the boat and he's hearing this successive, these successive teachings on the kingdom parables. So that's one of the things I want you to, to understand. He's, he's, he's already being primed. Now, it doesn't, I don't know that he's a believer here. I mean, it's not telling us this. It, 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 uh, Luke could be like going backwards to go back forwards. But look what it says. It says that when they had done this, they had closed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, look what it says. He fell down at, at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. 
You know, the presence of the Lord, when God moves and does something in your heart and yes. something in your life in yes. a big, big way, when you see God move, oftentimes what's going to happen is that it's going to smoke your heart. I thank God that Edwina, I know I sent some of y'all, y'all just happen to be in my top 10 text list. I don't know if I didn't send it to all of y'all, I apologize. But she sent me that seven minute video late last night, and I watched that, and I was like, oh Lord, I hope they got their notifications off, because they all gave the text to this thing. And dude, that thing, and they talked about the anguish of the Lord, it talked about pain, because you know who it was? It was David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson, a prophet that loved the Lord, and cried out for souls, and he would spend time in the presence of God and, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was beyond him and he was saying we basically what he was saying is we, our heart needs to be like the heart of our Lord we need to grieve over what our God grieves over and he's grieving over soul listen to me church if the Holy Spirit's going to move in the midst of our services, you know why he's doing that? He wants to give a hold of our lives. It's not just so that we'll feel good in the presence of God. Yeah. He wants us to feel good. He wants to encourage us. He wants to give us joy, unspeakable and full of glory. He wants to bring healing and deliverance. He wants to do all of those things. But he wants our heart Amen. to beat like his heart beats. He wants souls. To be one into the kingdom. He wants to see disciples made. And he wants his disciples to start adding long suffering and temperance yes. and patience and endurance yes. and less getting offended easily. Yes. And for us to learn how to walk in humility. Yes. Yes. And to let God have his place yes. That's right. <clears throat> in our hearts and in our lives. And so here's Peter, man. He falls down and he's like, I'm a sinful man. You know, I'm not going to go to all the scriptures, but in Luke 4 and 38, Jesus goes into Simon's house not long after that, and he healed his mother-in-law. Y'all remember the story? Yes. His mother-in-law had fever, so now he gets to see a miracle happen. I mean, Jesus walked in Peter's house, my friend. <laughs> Praise God, he might have been there more than that. I don't know, but Jesus was in Peter's house. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I want to take you to this one, this particular passage of scripture right here. In Matthew chapter 17, I'm going to go back to the uh, King James Version, Matthew chapter 17. This is about the Mount of Transfiguration. Because I want you to see, Peter was here, and Peter was present. So it was, it was James, John, and Peter, all right? And so it says... After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James and John, his brother, and he brought them up on a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, another way down would be Elijah, talking with them. So you get the picture. Jesus takes Matthew, James, I'm sorry, James, John, and, and, and Peter up on the mountain, and then all of a sudden Moses and Elijah appear, and they begin to talk with Jesus. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now look at this. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Do you think of a cloud in the Old Testament? Does that ring a bell to you about anything? You can just tuck it away in your spirit. But I just wonder, if you think about a cloud in the Old Testament, don't worry, I'm going to go ahead and reveal it. If, you, if you're not aware, it's okay. <clears throat> We're going to try to make sure that we teach the Bible at everybody's level, right? Some of you, but some of you, you already have alarms going off in your head. If I tell you to think about a cloud in the Old Testament, yeah. you already ought to be thinking about a cloud in the Old Testament, right? A prominent cloud in the Old Testament. He says, while he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. All right, so I wanted to go ahead and just, this is not really the spot, but look, I wanted to, this is what I wanted to share with you. These four concepts kind of jumped out. So this is a little bit of a teaching in the midst of this 
taking a snapshot into Peter's life. This is not connected directly to Peter's life, other than I think it's very interesting that he was exposed to this particular situation. And I can tell you right now that it affected the rest of his life, and I'm going to prove it to you in a second. But one thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit of New Testament. Can I use the word theology? Is that too big of a word? I mean, I don't mean, I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm just trying to make a point. Theology means the study of God. That shouldn't be a bad word. No. Amen. And so look, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 teaches, not for us not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now the word conformed means to be like, almost like a piece of clay and to be molded by a pot. So what it's saying is, is that if we're not careful, we will allow the external world to mold us. How do they do that? I mean, I've shared with you before what I think. As a matter of fact, recently I asked somebody to help me out. How do you think the world is trying to mold us? Can somebody just say one thing? Music. Music? Thank you. Anything else? Television. Television? Okay. Social media. The, the world, the spirit of the world is trying to teach us what they believe and, 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 and it's, the attempt is to mold us. Now, do you believe, do you believe the fact that there's an arch enemy of God that's actually really behind the spirit of Antichrist? That's moved into all of these types of media in an attempt to mold the people of God or mold human beings in its own image and in its own likeness, I hope that you can see that. But the Word of God says, don't be conformed, but be ye transformed. The reason I wanted to say that is this, is that this particular word right here, for transfigured that we're talking about, is this word here. Metamorphio. I, that's how I would say it. Metamorphio. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's the same word as transfigured. It's the same word as transform. That's the Greek word. It's the same Greek word. So what you need to understand is this, is that on the day that Jesus was transfigured, his glory was revealed. Who he truly is, his deity at that moment, what are you talking about? His godness. You can't say it like that. It's not a real word, I don't think. His godness, not his godliness, his godness, his nature as deity was revealed. He became white. He, the purity of his, of his clothing became white. The, his face started to shine in their presence. Right there, they were able to see it, right? Now, I want to, and, and, and so what I want you to know is this, is that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And look at this. The Holy Spirit actually allows you and I in us to become a partaker of the divine nature of God. We now are drawing from the divine nature of God. We are now being empowered by the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us. Normal Christianity, the sinful nature, the power of sin, is supposed to be lying dormant. It's not supposed to have power over us to where it can control us and tell us where to go and what to do. Can I just be real with you? I thank God that when the Holy Spirit's moving that we've been seeing people get delivered at the altar. But do, yeah. you, but do you understand something? If these people that get delivered at the altar do not understand the Word of God and they don't, and they don't learn to submit to the Word of God and they continue to go back out there and reconnect themselves to things that are ungodly, things that are unholy, boom! Yeah. Mr. Spirit Man is looking for six more friends or however many to try to find the room sweet clean so that it can move in and cause the condition of that person to be worse than what it was before. So the believers have to understand their word. We have to become Bible studying, Bible reading people. We have to become people that spend time in the presence of God. We have to allow God to have his way in our heart and life. We have to learn of the ways of God. And the only way we're going to do that, my friend, is if we get into the word of God. Yes. Amen. Is if we get into the word of God and we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal biblical truth to us. Yes. Because it's going to teach us how to walk with God. Yes. It's going to teach us 
how to navigate the journey. All right, let me hustle up here. It's faith shot. You know, I remember in the Old Testament that, that the Lord told Moses, no man can see my face and live. Look, I want to show you a couple of scriptures real quick. We'll go to Exodus 33 first, verse 18. Exodus 33, verse 18. I want you to see this. He said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. And this is Moses talking. Moses said, show me your glory. Now, you, you got to understand that whenever Jesus said, when the Bible says that Jesus' face did shine, I'm here to tell you that in Jesus' human form, the glory of God shined through him. The glory of God, his deity, shined through him. So I want you to keep that in mind. It says, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, talking about God, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you cannot, he said, you cannot see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. I want you to see that. Because you see, man cannot see the glory of God. Now let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 9. So now we're talking about Elijah. Who's the two people that were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? Moses, Moses and Elijah, right? It says, he came there unto a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? That's God talking to him. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars, and they've slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. You know, I didn't really want to get into the backstory on this because it's really a long, but it's some beautiful context. I can't really hold it up myself. You know, whenever Elijah had a showdown with the prophets of Baal, what was it, 450 prophets of Baal and maybe some other ones mixed up in there? And Elijah had a showdown. And fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and proved who the one true God was. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jezebel tells somebody, let Elijah know, I'm going to kill him. Yeah. And this prophet just saw the, one of the biggest miracles that you'll ever see in the Bible. And the next thing you know, he's on the run. He's on the run and he's sitting inside the cave. And now the Holy Spirit comes to him. You know, and the Holy Spirit, you know, God the Father, God comes to him and starts to speak to him and is asking him. And Elijah's under the impression that he's the only real prophet of God. But God explains to him, no. See, sometimes we think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to. I hate to bring the bad news to you, but if I decided to retire tomorrow, God's got somebody just waiting for the opportunity to work for him. God's got somebody in the wings waiting to grab the mantle, to grab the baton, and to keep on running. But as long as I got breath in my lungs by the grace of God, I'm not going to pass the baton unless the Lord says pass the baton. I want to keep preaching the gospel because I appreciate the calling. So he says, they thrown down your altars. They seek my life. They want to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind, rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still, small voice. It's a whole other teacher right there, my friend. We've been talking about it lately, but... Sometimes it's good to just rest and be quiet in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Give him an opportunity to talk. Amen. <laughs> and look at this. And it was so. When Elijah heard it, what did he do? He wrapped his face in his mantle. Two stories. Two men. One named Moses. One named Elijah. God told Moses, you know man can see my face. Or else he will die. And God told Elijah, and, and Elijah wraps his face. And so I want you to see, 
the, the awesome revelation that just happened. Because look, let's go back to the fact that there's a bright cloud. Let's look at this. Exodus chapter 9, verse 9. I told you when we go back to it. Exodus chapter 9, verse 9. It shall come, it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt. Oh, that was the wrong scripture. Well, let me tell you. He was talking about his cloud. He was talking about the glory cloud. And he was talking about the fact that his presence in the cloud was going to lead the children of Israel in the right direction. Amen. Yeah. And that the, the cloud represented his presence. Yeah. So what I need you to see here is this. Is that the cloud of glory was in the Old Testament. And what I want you to understand is that even though Peter was a simple fisherman. Pete, the, the children of Israel understood the Old Testament Bible. They were taught it when they were little children. They, they, they was quoted to them by their parents. I can promise you Peter. Now whether or not he got the main revelation right here on the Mount of Transfiguration. I want you to know it affected the entirety of his life. Sure. While he was there. This cloud showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus' face became like bright, shining light. And I cannot help but think about the fact of this. Is that in the Old Testament, you couldn't see the glory of God. In the Old Testament, you couldn't look on the face of God. And in this particular situation, Peter and John and James were able to see the glory of God. Because God became man. And dwelled amongst us. So that he could reveal himself. Amen. To a lost Amen. sinful race. So that we can see him. And listen. I'm not saying that this is really the only reason. Because as a matter of fact. I don't believe it is. But Moses and Elijah. Two men recorded in the Old Testament. That had to hide their face from the presence of God. Yes. Were given the privilege. To be able to look. And to see the glory of God. Now there's a lot of other information. Many people believe. That these two witnesses will be the witnesses in the book of Revelation. We don't really have to say that in passing. We don't really have time to go there right now. But I wanted you to see that. That that's how much God loves us. And that's how much God wants to reveal himself to us. He sent Jesus in human form so that we could get a revelation of the Lord so that we can know him. Amen? Alright, so then I wanted you to see that. Now look, this is, this is the other thing I wanted you to see. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. I love this, uh, this particular uh, passage of, of Scripture. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. This is, this is Peter talking. He says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Like in other words, this isn't just some little story that we're telling you and that we're repeating. Mm -hmm. Well, we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, look at this, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Yeah. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you would take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What a beautiful thing, amen? You know, some people say that he was transfigured on the Mount of Hermon. That would be a whole other can of worms to open up. But according to, according to certain tradition, Mount Hermon was where the fallen angels descended and kind of did some of their mischief out of, out of Genesis. It's also supposedly at the foot of Mount Hermon where, the, where there was a place that was literally called the gates of hell. And that's where Jesus talked to Peter, by the way. That was another thing I didn't even put in my notes, that the Lord asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And he said, they say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father in heaven. Amen. Yeah. And upon this rock, the gates of hell will not prevail again. I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it's the truth of what Peter had a revelation of. That you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that truth, upon Jesus, God built his church. Amen. But look, this day star, Peter's remembering when he saw the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus and be saying, this is a good word of prophecy. You would do well if you took heed to the light that shines. God's speaking to a lost world. And he's saying that he has light. But much of the world doesn't want to receive his light. Lord, help us to have those opportunities, amen, to share the light. Listen, I'm going to kind of be a little bit quick with some of these verses. But if you remember right before the cross, it's in Matthew chapter 26. And there's actually kind of like a long passage of it. And I'm not even going to turn there. I just want to remind you of it. Peter, Jesus talks about they will strike the shepherd and the sheep are going to scatter. Y'all remember when Jesus said that? And Peter says, though all may forsake you, I will never leave you. That's what Peter said. He said, they might all, they might all forsake you, but I'm not going to leave you. And at some point Jesus says, before the rooster crows three times, no, I'm sorry, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And when the, when the rooster crowed, and Peter had denied him those three times. If you go to another scripture in John chapter, well, before, before we go there, I want you to know that I believe that Peter really, really meant it when he said it. You know, there's a lot of believers that really do mean well. And we got it, we got it sometimes we gotta have a little patience with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I can promise you, I know that Peter meant it when he said what he said. Let me tell you why. Because when those soldiers came to get Jesus, what did he do? Cut the ear. That's right, he cut that ear off. Now there's a whole lot I can teach on that because the name Simon actually means hearing. And God called him to be a fisher of men. And God called him to preach the gospel. And he cut that man's ear off. How do you expect somebody to be able to hear if you cut their ear off? And for you and I, as believers, we probably won't go around pulling our pocket knife off and whittling people's ears off. But sometimes the way we behave, sometimes the way that we act towards other people, and then we want to come back around and we don't talk about our Jesus, it makes it difficult. They, they've, had, they've gotten their hearts hard. But nevertheless, the point I wanted to make is Peter did business. Peter did business with the Lord, and he pulled that sword out, but he was trying to do it in his own strength, in his own flesh. But what I wanted you to see is, is this, is that in John chapter 21, in John chapter 21, starting at uh, verse 3, now this is a long passage of scripture, Simon says unto them, now look, he says, I go fishing. Now, in the Greek, you've got to take my word for it, but I read behind a Greek scholar multiple times, Kenneth Weiss, and this is his, or take, his take on this. The way that your grammar is in the Greek, the idea here is that this isn't just a simple fishing trip. This is Peter going back to his old way of life. This is Peter now dejected after <coughs> denying the Lord three times before the rooster crowed. This is Peter broke down busted and disgusted. You ever been there as a believer where the enemy is attacking you and trying to burden you and make you feel as though you're unworthy? So look, this is a big deal because Peter, God's, the Lord is expecting Peter to operate in the gift that he's given him. And the Bible says, Peter says, I go fishing and then they said unto him, we're going to go with you also. And they went forth and look at this, they caught nothing. Isn't that amazing? Like, if you go back to the original story I read to you in Luke 5, what was the deal? Lord, we toiled all night long. We can't catch nothing. But at your word, I will drop the nets. Same thing. You know, have you ever, hopefully you haven't. Please don't fall away from the Lord. You know, Joseph did not fall. Joseph did a little ninja move, boom, boom, and he was gone, right? But for all you that are Josephs, I got good news. If we can't be a Joseph, we can't be a David. Amen. And we can fall on our face, prostrate in the faith in the presence of the Lord. Don't let the enemy condemn you because you feel as though you've failed. But look, when you turn away from the Lord and you begin to move in another direction, you're going to find out that you're right back at square one where he, where he picked you up at the time you fell. You're going to find out that you're right back where you, where you started. And until you let the Lord redeem you, and reconcile you and bring you back to where you need to be, you're going to be D 
dealing with some empty nets, my friend. And that's what happened. But when the morning came, Jesus came. Amen. And he, and he asked them if they had any food. And anyway, he told them to cast their nets and they were able to draw more fish. And nets didn't break that time. Amen. But I want to go ahead and fast forward. And I want to show you something right here. I thought this was powerful because we're talking about Peter's life. We're talking about the fact that he's already fallen on the beach. And he said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. He saw Jesus heal his mother-in-law. He, um, yes. you know, he, see, he saw the glory of Jesus manifest on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right. And here, uh, Jesus begins to talk. And look what he says in verse 15. He says, they dined with Jesus and Jesus asks him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now, the first thing I want to ask you, I just find that, see, this is the kind of stuff that gets me. Right? This is a, this is a plural pronoun. All right, I'm not trying to get all fancy. I'm trying to make a point. Plural pronoun. Now you imagine this scene with me for a second. We're on the beach. We know Jesus is there. The disciples are there, and there's a multitude of fish. Mm -hmm. Who do you think this plural pronoun belongs to? Now I got to tell you, in my opinion, whatever you say is just going to be an opinion. <laughs> Because I don't know how we can tell, unless there's another spot in Scripture that you can show me, is God talking about the fish? Because he said, I go fishing, and he's turning his back on the Lord? Or is he bringing him back to the last scene we talked about? I will never leave you or forsake you. No matter what all the other ones do, I will not forsake you. So who is the plural pronoun belong to? I don't really know for sure, but it works either way. Because this is number one. Number one is, do you love these fish more than me? Do you love the things of the world more than you love me? Are you going to quit on me every time things aren't going your way? Or are you going to stay faithful in your relationship and your calling to me? Amen. I don't know about you, but I need help. We need help, amen. And then if it's the disciples, boy, you needed you needed a little spanking, Peter, because you really thought really highly of yourself to think that even though the disciple that the disciples might forsake you, that you, Peter, weren't gonna forsake you. So one a couple of things I made like a little PowerPoint for you because I wanted you to be able to see this. So Jesus is gonna talk to him about love. And I can tell you. This scene right here, this also affected Peter's life. You got to know that after you've fallen away from God, Jesus shows up on the beach specifically to redeem you, specifically to minister to you. Amen? And the word says right here, he talks about love. And so I want you to know that there's at least two different words in the Bible, agape love versus phileo love. And agape love many times is talked about as God's type of love. Phileo love, many times people say, is a brotherly love. That's where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Right. Agape, people use to describe God's love. But I want you to see something real quick. Let's go ahead and get a definition right here for agape love. The main part of the definition I wanted you to see is this. Place, place first in one's affection. What is it? Do you love God like that? I mean, I'm just asking a question. I'm not trying to call it out. I'm asking. Do you love God in such a way that He is placed first in your affections? Or is there something else that sits in that chair or takes that place, whether it's family, whether it's job, whatever it may be? Um, you know, is there something else that's there? I wanted you to see that, right? Phileo love means to, among other things, to have a deep feeling for someone, to be very fond, okay, or to love with fondness, you know? Um, I mean, I can say that I got some brothers in the Lord that I feel very fond towards them. I mean, I, I'm very appreciative of all of y'all, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm telling you, after I asked the Lord to make me a pastor, it's been a whole lot better. I just love people. Amen? Well, I mean, I loved people before, but you get the point. 
And so I wanted you to, I wanted you to see that because now we're going to go back to the text for a little bit. And he says, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou? I want, and I'm going to screenshot this because I want you to see this real, real quick. And I'm going to go ahead and blow it up a little bit. And I want you to see what the word is right here. You see this? It's, it's spelled a little different, but it's the word agape in the Greek. So this is talking about that kind of love that puts Jesus. So when Jesus is asking him, because after this, I'm just going to go ahead and say the words instead. Jesus is saying, Simon, do you agape me? Do you love me in such a way that I have the preeminent spot in your life? Am I the one that all your affection is put towards? Am I number one in your life? And so that's what the Lord's asking him. And now look at how Peter responds. He says unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Look at this. He says, Peter, do you love me with agape love? Do you put me numero uno in your life? Peter's response is, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. You know that I do love you. You know that I care about you. Because listen. I don't know about you, but if I was in Peter's sandals at this point, after I had denied the Lord three times, I'm telling you right now, I'd probably be a little contract. Because yes. I thought it was pretty big britches there for a second. And now Jesus singles me out in front of everybody and the fish. And he wants to know, do you agape me? And Peter's response is, Lord, I can't, I can't say it. I can't say I agape you. Because obviously I cared about my own life more than I cared about you at that moment in time, right? And so what I need you to know is, is that the next two times, or when he says it the second time, Jonas, do you love me? He says it the second time, Jonas, do you agape me? He says to him, Lord, you know I delay you. Now look at this. He says to him a third time, Simon, son of Joseph, lovest thou me? Look at this. Simon, son of Joseph, do you fight me on me? Do you really? Are you really that fond of me? He's questioning, he's really digging deep now. He's really getting to the bottom of this. And he's wanting Peter to question his own motives. And then, and then Peter, look what it says, grieved. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. So then the movie says, okay, feed my sheep. You can't go back to fishing. Man. You can't leave your faith. You can't leave your call. That's right. Yeah. You have to do what I called you to do. Yes. You have to feed my yes. sheep. And he goes on to tell him about how he's going to die. And so as he gets older. So I just wanted you to be able to see that. That, that how the Lord is ministering and how the Lord, even though we've fallen short of the glory of God, God wants to get a hold of our hearts and our lives and he wants to move us in the place, amen, where, where he can bring you. I'm almost done. So look, real quick, I'm going to tell you that Peter, after this, he does what the Lord told him to do along with the other disciples and they're in the upper room and they're waiting for the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls on the day of Pentecost. And like cloven tongues of fire light upon their head. And they all begin to speak with other tongues. Amen. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> and, and all of the people that are around start to say, look at these men. They're drunk. They're all drunk. And Peter said, no. They're not drunk. It's too early in the morning for that. He said, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of in the last days. He will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Amen. Your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Whole men will dream dreams. And there's going to be vapor of smoke. And there's going to, the sun's going to go black. And the moon is going to turn to blood. And there's going to be signs and wonders in the sky on that terrible, notable day of the Lord. Peter's over here preaching the first Holy Spirit-filled message, at least as far as apostles. Because now he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that 3,000 people were added to the church on that day. So Peter preaches a Holy Ghost message. Now, I want to kind of share something with you. Just bear with me. We're almost there. In the, in, 
in Acts chapter 10, verse 9 through 14. I'm not going to turn it over. I'm going to try to remind you of the story. The Bible says that Simon Peter was at a man named Simon's house. They both were named Simon. Simon the Tanner, and he lived by the sea. The Bible says that Simon Peter went up on the rooftop, and he had a vision, right? And the vision was a sheet that was clean, clenched on four corners, and in the sheet was all various types of unclean animals. Now, you got to know, in the Old Testament, the Jews were not allowed to eat unclean animals, right? And, and the Lord says to him, Peter, rise, kill, eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord. My lips have never touched anything unclean. The Lord continues to tell him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And then about that same time, there's a knock at the door. Cornelius' servant, Cornelius had been praying, and he sent him to go find Peter. And, they, and, and what they were, were they were Gentiles. What does that mean? They weren't Jews. They weren't Israelites. Okay? That meant that, the God, that Cornelius was crying out to the Lord. He was a proselyte Jew. This is a long story behind that. But he was, he was not a Jew by birth. But he, but he prayed to the God of the Jews. And he, had been, and he was a very devout man. And he had been praying because he wanted more of the Lord. And Peter listened, and he went over there, and he preached a message in this man's living room, and it was full of people. And the next thing you know, they all started speaking in other tongues. Amen. What God was trying to show Peter, very distinctive, was this. What God did show Peter, very distinctively, was this. That the gospel was also for those that were not born as Jews. Aren't you glad tonight Amen. that the Lord... Sent the gospel yes. for us also. Yes. So that's a major revelation, right? You're sitting up on a rooftop. God sends you this vision, and and you get, and then you go preach at this Gentile's house, and the Holy Spirit's poured out. They all get filled with the Holy Ghost. They all speak speaking in other tongues, and and you see the power of God moving. But now look at this. I am going to turn to this one because I want you to see this. Because I'm trying to give us a. A picture of the life of Peter. Maybe it'll help us whenever we um, begin to move forward in, in some of the letters. It says right here, when Peter came to Antioch. You know, there was a city on the Mediterranean coast called Antioch. The Bible says that it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. Okay, interesting little piece of information. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, this is Paul talking right here, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So now this is an interesting thing. I did a lot of research on this way back in the past. And I'm shooting from the hip, but from what I remember, Peter had actually originally established the church in Antioch. All right. Paul was now teaching in Antioch, and then Peter comes back to Antioch. And he says, so, so what you got to understand is, is that theoretically, Peter is kind of like the pastor, I guess you would say. Yeah. He's kind of like the authority yeah. over this congregation. Yeah. But it says Paul rebuked him openly yeah. and withstood it to his face. He's, and, this, and he explains why. For before certain came from James, talking about certain Jews came from James. Yeah, they got hot, dude. That's my fault. Whew. For, huh? That was not the voice of truth right there. That was the spirit of error. Let's keep going. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise. In other words, they played the hypocrites. That's what the word hip dissembled means. You want, to, you want to see? You probably will. You're probably ready to go. Come on. Y'all probably are ready to go. It's okay. But you know, I've only given everybody free. I'm not as cool as that other preacher I've been watching on TV because he says there's a door right there and you're welcome to use it. It's kind of like this when he says it. Yeah. I mean, I just loved it when he told me that. I just chuckled and laughed and I didn't even get offended. To act the hypocrite. I wanted you to see this right here. To act the hypocrite. Right? I wasn't really trying to run y'all off. So <laughs> <I never. laughs> but I understand. We got kids. 
So the other, the other Jews dissembled likewise. They played the hypocrite with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. So I wanted you to see that what happened was, was that Peter would eat with the Gentiles, but then all of a sudden, when some other Christian brothers wanted everybody to be circumcised, and they wouldn't eat with the Gentiles, Peter played the hypocrite and refused to eat, and he wouldn't eat with those circumcised Christians. And Paul said, what are you doing? You can't, you're not living like a Jew. Why would you expect Gentiles to live like a Jew? And I like to think about the fact that Peter had just received a revelation. He had just received a vision from the Holy Spirit that showed him that the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. And now he's turning around and he's moving backwards in the faith. And it was very important for Paul to bring correction to his life. Amen. Naya, musician, y'all can come to the front if you don't mind. And, uh, and I'm going to close with this last scripture right here. Second Peter chapter 3. I wanted, you to, I wanted you to see this because, look, I don't know about you, but if I was Peter, I probably would have. I probably would have got my feelings Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I would have I probably would have gotten frustrated and acted in the flesh and not been happy. And as time goes by, you know, that was about 10 years into, Christian, into Christianity whenever Peter did that. Y'all can just start playing this song for whenever y'all figure out the song I'm going to play. But look what it says right here in his letter that Peter wrote. Wherefore, beloved... Seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Yeah. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. You know, what, what Peter is saying right here is this our Lord is long suffering and he's waiting and he's merciful. Yeah. And the reason that he's long suffering for people like Thank you and me is because. He's, he wants us to be able to receive salvation. Yes. He wants us to be able to receive <coughs> salvation from sin. Amen? Amen. And he goes on to say this, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him as written unto you, as also in all his letters, speaking wow. in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, and unstable rest. You know what the word rest means right there? It means to be like on a torture rack. To be twisted up. To be twisted. Many times people twist the scriptures. You know, I was thinking, this isn't really probably that funny, but when I was in the 80s, there was a band. And I didn't like the band then. They were called Twisted Sister. That's not what we're talking about. Right here we're talking about twisted scriptures. People twist the scriptures. And look what it does. It causes destruction in their own life is what it does but the main thing i wanted you to see right here is that he called paul beloved that's a big it's a big term of endearment what it tells me is this is that even though paul was stood in his face even though paul publicly corrected him, peter with time learned to allow god to deal with his heart even though he might have been offended peter with time I learned how to let God deal with his heart, and he learned how to let the Lord have his way and to love his brother in the faith. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's go out of the house of God, sing praise to the Lamb of God. Amen? And as always, if you need prayer, I want you to know that the altars are open. Amen? Thank you, Jesus.